Okay. So today is many things. It is the our last class before the holiday of Shavuot. It's also our last class for this semester. Um, and so it would be what's called a, a siyum uh, opportunity. So a siyum is an opportunity um, to celebrate the conclusion of a course of study. So that would be this. Um, those of you who've had me before, I've done a siyum uh, prayer or reading at previous end of semesters or when students are leaving me. Um, you guys, we just keep continuing. So, <laughs> but this time we really are taking a break. Um, so, uh, so I'm not sure what order I'm going to do all these things in. I also have the slides for Ashray up on my desktop. Um, I don't want to forget. To, so I've said this before, but I'll say it again because maybe not everyone was in class the day I said it. So my assignment that I have accepted in Julia Loeb's Women's League administration for 2023 to 2026 is yeah. I will be the person heading up the Hebrew classes. So that's my that's my job. Um, and we haven't had any meetings about it because Julia is not the president yet. And I have too many other responsibilities focused on other things. So, um, you know, I got some emails from some of you asking, you know, what, what will I be teaching next year? And the answer is, I don't know. Um, and I don't know. We know that there is, um, interest in continuing, you know, a lot of you want to continue. Um, and a lot of, I only know obviously what level you guys are at, um, but there are a lot of other classes going on. And so we're going to have to meet and we're going to have to discuss it. Um, I, as you all have experienced, I have augmented our curriculum beyond just helping you become more fluent reading Hebrew. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and, and from your reaction to this, I think it's, it's, information that we should fold into some of these classes, if not even have um, opportunities for a broader dissemination of the information, whether it's um, Rabbi Wollens Fields or Rabbi Sella, maybe doing an all women's league class on some of this information about, you know, um, what's behind the way um, Shahrit is structured or what's behind the way, you know, the difference between um, all the different um, Kaddishes or who knows, you know, there's so much information there. And I think there's a lot of interest. And well, for some of you, those in my class, that might be repetition. If it's taught by a rabbi, it'll probably be at a higher level than the level I was able to give you. Um, but I hope everyone finds it, you know, informative and interesting. And enhances your understanding and, um, and what you get out of your prayer session or any other study of, you know, Jewish information. So anyway, so that's my little spiel on that. Okay. Um, and also, as I've said before, and the three of you who are in the bat mitzvah class, we'll start our own dialogue separate from the rest of the class to talk about if you want to come Friday mornings to practice, which Fridays you want to come, how you want to do all of that. But that that will be, you know, just the four of us. Okay. So um let's talk about Shavuot. Shavuot begins at sundown on the 25th, next Thursday. And I know you know that it is the conclusion of the counting of the Omer because we've all talked about that. Um, so that's the agricultural portion or reference for Shavuot. Um, so agricult the agricultural significance is also indicated by the first two references to the festival in the Torah. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks, even the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of harvest the first fruits of thy labors, which thou sowest in the field. So those are lines from Exodus chapters 22, I'm sorry, 23 and 34. So um, so 
so interestingly, apparently the, ho <clears throat> the holiday has many names. I, I know about some of them, but I didn't know one of them. Hag Hakatsir, the Harvest Festival. I don't remember ever being told that name for Shavuot, Hag Hakatsir. Um, but certainly Hag HaShavuot, which indicates um, just the date that it comes after the counting of the seven weeks of the Omer. Um, so in the Talmud, the name Atzeret is also given to the festival. Um, so the sages regarded Shavuot as the conclusion of the festival of Pesach and therefore called it Atzeret, just as the conclusion of the Sukkot festival is called Shmini. I'm sorry, Shmini Atzeret. So um, according to rabbinic interpretation of the Bible, the Ten Commandments were given on the sixth day of Sivan. Shavuot thus is Zman Matan Toratenu, right? That's what I learned as a very small child, commemorating and emphasizing the giving of the Torah and the sanctity of those days, because Shavuot occurs on the sixth and seventh day of Sivan. And so the Ten Commandments were given on the sixth day. Um, okay, so let's see, let's talk about the special observances on Shavuot. Um, so Shavuot is treated just like Pesach. Um, so uh, services are in in synagogue, you know, shacharit, etc. Services are are virtually the same. Um, the difference being where you would mention Pesach, you instead will mention Shavuot. Um, uh, on both days of Shavuot, so we ha we celebrate two two days. Um, that the two Chagim days, which are treated like the two first days of Pesach. So just like a Shabbat, no work is allowed, etc. cetera. Um, two Torah scrolls are removed from the Ark. Um, on the first day in the first scroll, we read Exodus 19 and 20, which tell of the giving of the Ten Commandments. In the second scroll, we read from Numbers, telling of the festival of Shavuot. The Haftorah is Ezekiel, Um, contains the prophet's vision of God. On the second day, we read from Deuteronomy, which speaks of the festivals. On a Sabbath, so if Shavuot falls on Shabbat, we read a different section of Deuteronomy, and the Haftor is Hab Habakkuk, I am not, not one I'm familiar with, where the revelation at Sinai is mentioned. Okay, on the second day, we say Yisker, after the Torah reading, just like on the last day of Pesach and on Yom Kippur. Okay, so this is the, the big difference about Shavuot, or the, the, the modern day observance is very different from any other holiday. It is customary to start the evening services of the first night later than usual. This is to sanctify, I'm sorry, to satisfy the implication of the verse um, we count seven complete weeks. Therefore, we wait to make sure that the 49th day has been fully completed. They're very literal. Um, it was an ancient custom for Jews to remain awake for the entire first night of Shavuot to study Torah. The Zohar ascribes this custom to particularly pious Jews. In Eastern Europe, it was widely observed in a special text for the occasion um, known as Tikkun Leil Shavuot, developed, which contained, <coughs> excuse me, which contained the first and last verses of each Sidra, the first and last passages of each tractate of the Mishnah, and excerpts from the Zohar. A quaint reason is given for the practice of staying awake on the first night of Shavuot. Legend tells that the children of Israel slept so soundly the night before the Torah was given that they had to be awakened with thunder and lightning. We, on the contrary, are up all night and need not be awakened. The more obvious reason is that we review the Torah to celebrate the anniversary of its giving. So certainly at my show, we start and come together at about 11 o'clock at night and they, st and they start studying, um, they do Leil Shavuot. Um, is that common where you guys are? Yes. Start earlier. Yes. Start earlier? 
Yeah, I, we're gonna do something for the high school seniors at 7.30 and then there's a reception. And then I think classes are starting around nine or something like that. So okay. it's typical to be not nine or 10. Yeah, I think, I think they invite people to come earlier but they start this study, I think at like 11 o'clock. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so um, the other thing about Shavuot, which, well, there's a couple other things. The book of Ruth is read on the second day of Shavuot. Um, many explanations are given for the reading. Uh, most quoted reason is Ruth's coming to Israel took place around the time of Shavuot and her acceptance of the Jewish faith was like Matan Torah for the people of Israel. So the giving of the Torah, the acceptance of the Torah entails suffering and sacrifice for us, just as it did for Ruth. Um, the more logical reason is the desire to have se sections from all three divisions of the Bible, the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim in the liturgy of Shavuot and to show that they are all divine. And why the book of Ruth? Because in the Talmud, Ruth is counted as the first book in the Ketuvim. Um, and then it is customary to eat dairy dishes on the first day of Shavuot. I've never quite got this one, but many reasons have been given. One, dessert, one derives from the verse, honey and milk shall be under your tongue, which is made to refer to the Torah, implying that the words of the Torah are as pleasant and acceptable to our ears and hearts as milk and honey are to our tongues. It has also been suggested that just as we have two food items, the shank bone and the egg at the Seder to represent the two sacrificial offerings brought to the temple on Pesach. On Shavuot, we have two types of food, first milk and later meat in commemoration of the two special sacrificial offerings that were brought on Shavuot. Um, one more reason, which is taken seriously by many though, is facetious. <laughs> With the giving of the Torah, the dietary laws were established. Hence, when the people came home from Sinai, they could not eat meat because they had none that was prepared properly. To prepare for new, the new meat properly would take too long. They had no choice, therefore, but to eat milk dishes. Hmm, okay. Um, so the more logical reason, which may be an afterthought, connects the custom of eating dairy with restraint and self-control. The Torah is gained by eschewing pleasures and excesses. Meat is the food of those who know no restraint. Anyway, okay. Um, it is also customary on Shavuot to decorate the synagogue with flowers and foliage. And in some places, the floors of the synagogue were strewn with fresh grass as a reminder of the agricultural character of the festival. Um, all right. So this is what happened at my synagogue <clears throat> for so many years. Confirmation services were held. So I was confirmed on Shavuot. Um, uh, the confirmation service has no roots in Jewish tradition, but was instituted in the early 19th century in Germany by the reform movement. It was frankly an important importation from the Lutheran church, but it struck roots in the Jewish community and was accepted by the conservative synagogues and even some Orthodox synagogues. There's no uniform service, no uniform age, and no uniform curriculum for preparation. The purpose, however, is to, sol is to solemnly initiate young boys or girls into you know, the faith. So for us, confirmation was concluding all of the years of Hebrew school that the synagogue offered. So it was post bar bat mitzvah. There were a couple more years of study offered. And if you got to that point, you participated in this confirmation service on Shavuot. I remember we were told to wear white and I was wearing the most heinous white shoes. I hate white shoes. I've always <laughs> Poor Rachel. Shoes. <laughs> So it is. Maybe it's because I feel like I have big feet and white shoes on big feet just make them look bigger. Anyway. Did you <laughs> so, wear white shoes at your wedding? Um, I did, but you couldn't see them and they were pumps and they were they were proportioned better than the white shoes I wore at my confirmation, which at that time they were clunky and I hated them. But I wore them. <laughs> 
<laughs> what can I say? Okay. Um, all right. So today I have, let me make sure I have it up on my screen. Give me half a second. I also, so I was going through the JTS, Jewish Theological Seminary, community learning on their website, which I have shared other things with you from that website, particularly about counting of the Omer and so forth, um, and things for, oh, certainly about Passover. It's a wonderful online library of amazing pieces written by various educators uh, from the Jewish Theological Seminary. So the one I have today um, is actually, so it's, um, there's a recording of it as well as the text. So we get to listen to the author read it to us, which I think will be lovely. I hope you agree. So this is Jen <clears throat> Erbach. She's the director of the Block Kochler Center for Spiritual Arts. Um, I actually have had the pleasure of being in the room when she's done some teaching. And she's, as I say, she's lovely and wonderful. And this, um, I was looking for Devar Torahs about Bamidbar, the Torah portion. This one struck me um, because I think it also connects to the fact that we are concluding a very long um, study session together. So I hope you enjoy it. And tell me if it's loud enough, okay? It's, it's nine and a half minutes and I really want you to hear it. But you'll also be able to if you can read along as she is talking. Okay. Can you hear okay? No. No. From JTS. No, I can't. Please cover. I'm gonna make it a little louder. Tree from the Jewish Theological Seminary. This is Rabbi Jan Erbach, director of the Block Holker Center for the Spiritual Arts at JTS, with a commentary for Baha'u'llah. How do we progress toward our goals, individually and societally? How do we know when to move forward and which direction to go? At first glance, the description of the Israelites' journey from Sinai to the Promised Land seems to offer a model of clarity and ease. Whenever the cloud lifted from the tent, the Israelites would set out accordingly. And at the place where the cloud settled, there the Israelites would encamp. At the word of Adonai, the Israelites journeyed, and at the word of Adonai, they encamped. They remained encamped as long as the cloud rested on the Mishkan. When the cloud lingered on the Mishkan many days, the Israelites observed Adonai's mandate and did not journey on. There were times when the cloud was over the Mishkan for a few days. At the word of Adonai, they encamped, and at the word of Adonai, they journeyed. There were times when the cloud was there from evening until morning, and would lift in the morning, and they would journey. Whether day or night, when the cloud lifted, they would journey. Whether two days, or a month, or a year, however long the cloud lingered on the Mishkan, the Israelites remained encamped and did not journey. Only when it lifted did they break camp. By the word of Adonai, they encamped, and by the word of Adonai, they journeyed. They observed Adonai's mandate by the word of Adonai through Moses. It's a comforting solution. Just follow the word of God. But unfortunately, not especially helpful. If the Torah's message is eternal, what does this model offer those of us, i.e. all of us, to whom God doesn't speak quite so distinctly? Fortunately, it's not the only answer the Torah provides. Intermingled with this description of a straightforward, unwavering journey at the clear command of God, the Torah offers also a counter-narrative. Looking more closely, we come to suspect that God's directions were anything but clear. Within this passage itself, God's guidance is expressed not in distinct speech, but through a cloud, a metaphor suggesting obfuscation, not clarity, and needs to be mediated or interpreted through Moses. Immediately afterwards, we discover that additional 
navigational technologies are necessary. Journeying instructions were given via trumpets, specially crafted by Moses and blown by the Kohanim. The Ark of the Covenant traveled on ahead of them, quote, to seek out a resting place for them, unquote. And most tellingly, Moses pleaded with his father-in-law, Chavav, to be their human guide. Moses said, please do not abandon us. Inasmuch as you know where we should camp in the wilderness, and you will be like eyes for us. In other words, the path forward is never clear, and God isn't a divine GPS. Revelation and faith shape our vision of where we want to go. They offer a compass pointing to true north, orienting us in the general direction of that vision. But to get there, we need maps, road signs, traffic signals, and human guides with a variety of expertise, religious and secular. Similarly, although on the surface God intended and Israel expected that they would proceed directly and quickly to the promised land, according to Rashi, within three days, the counter narrative suggests that was never a realistic vision. The commentators sensitively pick up on the challenges inherent even in what was supposed to be a short journey most especially the standing still and waiting for an unknown time. For example, Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch writes, it is not so much the strain of lengthy wanderings as the patient endurance of the lengthy stops, which seem to be stressed is the real task of the tests. Similarly, Ramban, Bahia, and Sforno highlight the uncertainty and unpredictability of the encampments as especially difficult to bear. The result was on the one hand, impatient, self-reinforcing complaining about the current situation. And on the other hand, disastrous spying ahead into the future, sapping the community of courage and keeping them from moving forward, combined they turned a short trek into a 40-year roundabout <clears throat> journey. Here again, the contrast between the idealized intent and the reality on the ground speaks directly to the human condition. A journey worth taking is never linear, never easy, and we never handle it perfectly. While it's natural to fantasize about quick fixes, lasting transformation, true progress, takes time and inevitably meanders through error, regression, and backlash. Like the Israelites in the wilderness, it is rarely as simple as at the word of Adonai we journey and at the word of Adonai we encamp. Rather, our fears keep us stuck when we're called to advance and our impatience and inability to bear uncertainty push us ahead when we're called to stand still. <clears throat> Thankfully, Judaism offers a wide complement of navigational tools to hone our powers of discernment, make us more sensitive readers of the terrain we traverse, and keep us on the path. Torah study with a partner, prayer and meditation, halachic observance, deeds of love and kindness, the practice of Musar, character development, participation in Jewish community, live or virtual, all function as the maps signposts, and traffic signals we need. And they nourish our resilience when the road ahead looks frightening, or the waiting and uncertainty seem almost too much to bear. And ideally, our errors become teachers and guides too. Of the many navigational technologies that the Israelites utilized in the wilderness, perhaps the oddest was the ark. In Numbers 10, 33, we learn, the Ark of the Covenant of Adonai traveled in front of them a three days distance to seek out a resting place for them. But this presents a difficulty. Elsewhere, in Numbers 14, we learn that the Ark of the Covenant of Moses and Adonai did not move from the midst of the camp. How can the Ark be in the middle of the camp and also somehow traveling by itself three days ahead? In solving the problem, 
The Midrash offers a profound lesson in how we progress toward our goals. There were two arcs. One, with the tablets, stayed in the middle of the camp. A second arc proceeded ahead to seek out the encampments. And what was in that second arc? The broken tablets, destroyed by Moses on the golden path. The path to the future moves through the past. We look ahead in our travels only to discover that our mistakes and sins, our brokenness, are three days journey ahead, allowing us the benefit of critical distance, but waiting for us nevertheless. The arc with our brokenness tells us where we need to stop and wait, to explore the issues and places that need attention, rectification, and healing in order to move forward again in the right direction. It takes courage, patience, and resilience. And perhaps this is why, according to Rashi, the place where they rested is also called a journey. Shabbat Shalom. If you enjoyed this wow. program, please rate and review it on Apple Podcasts on, I gotta make him... and discover JCS's other series. Okay, sorry about that. So I found yep. that wonderful. That was inspirational and very interesting. Like the metaphors, all the life metaphors. Really? And, and, and the way she read it is very different from how I would have read it, her way better. So I wanted you to hear her reading it to us. So, um, um, I, and, I, and I hope that, you know, your belief in and practice of Judaism, Judaism is a journey. You know, I see life as a journey. Um, and obviously my Judaism is so knitted to my life that it's, the, it's part of the journey. Okay, <clears throat> um, let's do Ashray, whether you want to or not. Let's do Ashray. <laughs> do we know what's happened to Susan Strasberg and her tree? She hasn't been with us. I'm her, sorry, Susan. Is that Susan? Say again? Susan Strasberg? Susan Steinberg. Steinberg. Steinberg, yes. Yeah. Um, Steinberg. 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 Yeah. Um, I'm not no, sure what you're you. asking. I, I said, oh, yes, the tree that she has behind her for her region, yes, yeah, that's her southern region. region. Banner. Yeah, it's her region banner. Um, she, she's just had a bunch going on, um, which is why she hasn't made it to class. Um, so, but um, she's going to be a convention, right? Yes, she's definitely going to be at convention if her health allows it. But at this point, she's assuring us that we will be 13 to region presidents yeah. together. Yeah, she's planning. Yeah, okay. And I know... Uh, she has her yeah, ticket. I mean, she's meeting us at the airport for transportation, etc. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay. All right, ladies. So if you want to pull up your own version of Ashra, you can. <clears throat> I have it on my screen. I seem to... have a frog or some dryness in my throat that just doesn't want to go away today <clears throat> so i feel you have to, have to excuse my throat clearing it's dreadful okay that's okay um thank you <laughs> so kind Wait, of you before you get started i have not looked at anything in 12 days so i'm rusty <laughs> it's quite all right i tell you what We'll give you the easy part, the first two lines. I know you remember them in your head. How's that? That's very generous, for which I am grateful. <laughs> and pardon my raspy voice, too. Too much talking. Okay. When did Marlene, when did you actually get back from Europe? Last night. I woke oh, up an hour no. before class. <laughs> oh, my golly. <laughs> it's now, uh, let's see, it's now, uh, what's it, quarter to 11, so it's a quarter to five London time, but... I knew I didn't want to miss this. Too important. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, radio, are we reading? Or are we singing? Whatever. It's totally up to you. All it's right. your choice. Well, if I know the words, I can sing it. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
Ojahalaluha Sela Ashreha Am Shekhat Shekhata Ahlo Ashreha Am Sha'aronoi Elohav Okay, thank you. You can stop. That was lovely. Truly, you you have that down even in your sleep deprived state. Beautiful. And so what we were doing last week is um, I read through the whole thing, then I would assign each of you to read, and then I would sing the part that you had just read. But since you already just sang that part, I don't need to sing it back. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, Marjorie, will you continue um, and do two more lines for us, the Aleph and the Bet line? Oh, okay. You don't want me to do the two little words. Okay. Well, you yes, please do those, but then I want you still to do Aleph and Bet. Of course. I, three lines. Tehila Lidor Eid. Lidor Eid. Sorry. Are Mim Ha Alo. Ha, ha, okay, ma, lech. All right, let's slow down. Aromimcha, aromimcha. Okay, you had you need the row as the second uh, syllable. I didn't say the row. Oh dear. No, Aromimcha. that's okay. Aromimcha, Eloha, Hamalach, Melech, Melech. Melech. I'm I'm with Marlene. I haven't looked at this in a while. Va. No, not va. What's yes, the, yes, va. Yes, va. Va ad ta, tar ha. A var. So this is a vet. A va a var ha. A va var ha. Mim ha. Le olam va ed. Bikol yom ha. So this is actually, go down. The first word, this is a. CH, not a hard K. So, Bechal Yom. Bechal Yom. Avar Charda. Checha. Avar Checha. Checha. Da Ahal La. Shim Ha. Le Olam Vaed. Boy, did I murder that. It's okay. You got most of it. Tehila, tehila le David, aromimcha Elohai hamelech, va'avarcha shimcha le'olam va'ed, bechol yom avarchecha, va'ahala shimcha le'olam va'ed. Maybe I should have written. Marsha, will you continue? Is it big enough for you? Yes, fine. Badol Adonai. Um kulau maod, valig du dulato ain hekem heker. Dor la dor le shabach ma aseka ugvu roteka yagidu. Lovely. I'm going to chant it for you. Gadol adonai um kulau maod, valig dulato ain heker. Dor le dor yeshabach ma'asecha uvarotecha yagidu. Okay, um, Geraldine, are you okay to read for us? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Okay. We're at the door, 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 the door. Well, the line below that, we're at Hadar, oh. the hay line. Okay, I'm sorry. A dark abode hodeka, with the gray nibloteka asika. Beautiful. The asus noroteka yomeru. Ah, ugudula teka. Ugudula teka. Ulate, ulate. Ugudula teka. Ugudula teka. Good. All right. You did beautifully. I'm just gonna Bezus Norotecha Yomeru Ubdulatecha Asaprena. Okay, got it? Yes. You were so close. That's you're really making amazing strides. Uh Audrey, will you do uh the Zion line Zecher? 
you went away all of a sudden you're but you're you know, muted so there you are i was away i've been away but i'm back um chewing okay zay hair bar rav uh, rav <laughs> that's a trans <laughs> reverse um to uh to to ka to the car do you do anything yeah. with that? okay yeah yeah bay ooh yeah be you the the seed ka to ka mm -hmm. yeah ray nay new Yirani new. Okay. Han Hanu Vu Oh Hanu Boon. Hanun Hanun. Oh, okay. So the the dot in this nun is for emphasis or nothing. The so dot it's in this so that's the vowel for the noon for the nun. Exactly. Yeah. Precisely. Okay. The Rahu, the Rahum, Adonai, Erecha, Erech. No, that's not the right thing. Erech, Erech is right. Oh, okay. Um, Apayim, Ug, Dal, Has. Said. Yes. So it's Zecher of Tuvchaya Biu, Vitzit Katcha Yiranenu, Anun Vrachum Adonai, Erech Apaim Ubdal Chasad. Edith, will you read the last two on the page? Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tov Adonai Lakol Fall. Lakol. Mm -hmm. The Vira the Mav Al Kol Mayasa Mayasav Maasav. So the, the Ma second letter. Uh, yes, Maasav. So the the reason it's Ma -a, the second letter is an ayin, an ayin does not have any sound of its own. It's not like a yud where it would be a Y sound. It's just the vowel sound. So ma'asav. Okay. Next line. Um Yoduka Adonai Kol Ma A Seka. Mm-hmm. Vikasiv Deka. Mm -hmm. Yavar Kuka. Perfect. Beautiful. And I hear you trying to chant. So it's Tovadanai la kol, Varachamav al kol maasav, Yoducha adanai kol maasecha, Vasidecha Yavar Kuka. Excellent. Before you leave, on that last line, yes, ma'am. The, the second word from the end. Why does it? What? What's that? You you doing in there? Nothing much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So so syllabically, it's va ha si decha. So um, pronunciation-wise, whether that will yud is there or not, it would sound exactly the same. I don't know grammatically what that yud is doing there. I just can't answer you. Thank okay. You. <laughs> you, it's basically you are recognizing that in other places it adds a y sound, and here it doesn't seem to, and it's perfectly legitimate question, and we're just going to let it be. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Marlene, we are back to you because everyone's read. Can you do the top two lines? I know you can. Will you please? Are we on do the top that? of the next page? Um yes, in my book, Kavod Malchut. Kavod, okay. Yep. Okay. All right, here we go. 
kavod malchutacha yomeru uvurata yedaberu. Am I supposed to go on? Yes, you are. That was perfect. Keep going. <laughs> Quit while you're ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. One more time. Let's do it again. Let's Lahodea do another. Livne ha a ha a dam give ru give ru Okay, here. I'm gonna do it for. I'm gonna read it to you and chant it. Then you're gonna do it. Leho. Okay. So leho dia leho dia lifne ha adam gavuro tav uchvod hadar malchuto. So it's leho dia lifne ha adam gavuro tav uchvod hadar malchuto. You were very, very close. Okay, just wait one second because my landline is ringing. And I can't go over and, <laughs> and it's messing up our tune. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So everybody put your fingers in your ear. <laughs> put your fingers in your ear like little children. Okay. I'll do this slower instead of faster. Okay. Yeah. Leho 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 livne ha adam. I couldn't have planned that. Give give rota. Sorry, guys. Ukvod hadar machul machulto ma malkuto. Really good. With all those disruptions, you did a great job. All right, I'm going to chant these two back just for the hell of it because we just laughed too much through them. Kavod malchuto hayo meru uvuratcha yeda beru. Leho dia lifne ha adam gavuro tav uchvod hadar malchuto. But you did great, Marlene, with all those interruptions. Okay. Um, uh, Marshall, will you do the next line? Malchutaka malchut hal olamin umem shalta umem shaltaka bakal dor vador. So make. Hananoi, Lakal, Hanoflim, Vazokaf, Lakal, Hakufim. Lovely. The only thing I'm going to tell you is that you see all of these little T's that are larger. So yeah. here at under, and, and here, and yeah. here, and here. Instead of ah, they're really O. Oh. So, Mahutcha Mahut Kol Olamim, Umem Shaltcha Bechol Dorvador. And that's the pronunciation style of the book, and that's why they make them bigger. Um, so, it's Mahutcha Mahut Kol Olamim, Umem Shaltcha Bechol Dorvador. So, Mech Adonai Lechol Hanoflim, Zokef Lechol Hakfufim. So you read them lovely, very nicely. It's just that slight pronunciation difference. Learn okay. That's why we come to class. Could I ask a question, please? Um, just because of what you just said, Rachel. Does that mean that don't most books with bells have have that enlarged? It's not just um, love to limb. Well, right? certainly, it's. I think it's a dialect choice that they and they tell you at the front of the book. Right, but. Is so so for instance alone and see if they have it too right but so for instance if you were to listen to the Haredi mm -hmm. Jews do this I think it would sound different I think their dialect is slightly different okay that's my guess I'm not I say this based on um hearing them uh recently in a show I was watching um and their style of Hebrew, even prayers that are very common to us, let's just say Yisker or um, Kaddish, um, it sounded more um, Ashkenazic, like my great grandfather would say it, how Marjorie was taught, for instance, the, the difference in the Taf and the Saf and the Oz and all kinds of things like that, which is not how we're, I'm teaching you to read. 
Right. So one more question. When you talk about the Haredim, are you talking about Israeli Orthodox or are you talking about all Orthodox, like North American Orthodox? Um, no, I, I'm talking about ultra Orthodox wherever they are, because it's they're so influenced. And, um, and I think so much Yiddish is intermingled. Oh, yeah. Well, definitely. They say Adonai with a big oi. Right. Yes. OK, thank you. All right. So. Looking at the time, I'm not bigger. I say again, Marsha. In here, when I you know, practice, it's not a bigger all. Right, because that book is old, right? That's that's Go Lincoln's book, and that's right older. And I imagine that he um, also. I yeah. think wherever they got the the print, the Hebrew print for that Absolutely. book, yeah, it's not what we see today. There are slight differences in it's that in those, those words absolutely so okay so we're at a nay and it's 9 56 and i want to finish the prayer so i'm going to chant to you guys and then i want us to do the siyum prayer that i have so here i go Umaspia lechol chayratzon, tzadik adonai bechol drachav, vechasid bechol maasav, karov adonai lechol korav, lechol asher yikra uhu veemet, ritzon yureav yaase, veet shavatam ishma biyoshiem. Shomer Adonai et kol ohavav, ve et kol harshaim yashmid. Tehilat Adonai yedaber pi, ve yivarech kol basar, shem kad sholi olam va'ed, ve anach nu nivarech ya, meata ve'ad olam, hallelujah. Okay, it is up to you guys to keep practicing this because, because you want to make me proud. How's that? <laughs> That's why you have to come back with us next year so you find out. It, well, only if I drop in and say, okay, who's ever in this class who I had last year? One, two, three, here goes Ashray. So anyway. <laughs> all right. Anyway, all right. Um, Marlene, I muted you when you went on the phone just so you know you're now muted. All right, so this is a prayer. Sorry about that. that that's quite all right. Um, this prayer um, was used by uh, Barbara Ezring, actually, I th in, in, uh, at the conclusion of um, a siyum. Um, they, were, they were studying, um, they called it Follow the Moon, um, and they were doing it online, I believe, during the pandemic, but it may have started before the pandemic. Women's League was studying something. So anyway, but I really like it and think it's very appropriate. So here I go. It's only in English so you can understand it. May it be your will, our God, that as you have helped us to complete this portion of our studies, that you will continue to help us begin new areas of learning and to complete them, to learn and to teach, to observe, to wonder, and to love all the words of your Torah. May you give strength to your people. May you bless your people with peace. Chazak, chazak, venit chazek. Be strong, be strong, um, and give us strength. So that's what I wish for all of us.